Oh my god, hey! Welcome back to my Stager YouTube channel. If you are seeing my face for the first time, my name is Mickey Joe, and I am obsessed with all things theatre. Which is why I recently got back from a six-day trip to Edinburgh for the Edinburgh Fringe Festival. While I was there, I saw 37 shows in a variety of genres, but all to do with theatre. Ofs, because I'm obsessed with theatre. If you were listening, I wouldn't have needed to say that twice. I am an independent theatre critic and a content creator based here in the UK. And if this is your first visit to my Stage YouTube channel, this is where I tend to review shows that I've been invited to go and see. I talk about theatre, I react to stuff, I listen to stuff, I speculate wildly about fun theatrical gossip. If that sounds like the kind of thing that you would be into for your YouTube viewing pleasure, feel free to subscribe to my channel down below. And if you really enjoy today's video, not only must you subscribe to my channel, but feel free to give me a super thanks if you're feeling particularly generous. It would really help me as a content creator, because Edinburgh accommodation was expensive. So already on my channel, I have posted a vlog about the adventure that my boyfriend Aaron and I had in Edinburgh with some little clips of us running madly around the city trying to find food between shows. I then followed up with a monster review roundup of about 50 minutes of all of the plays that I saw in reverse order where I reviewed 12 different shows in one video. And today we are once again rounding up a bunch of different reviews and we are talking not about plays, not about musicals, but about one person shows specifically. So the one person show is very much a staple of the Edinburgh Fringe. You see it within the comedy circuit. You see, especially these days, you see a lot of comedy shows that are tending more towards little mini plays. A lot of this has actually come under fire from comedians who are being criticised by reviewers for not having detailed and layered enough stand-up comedy shows where they're just doing stand-up and people are now expecting something more theatrical and constructed and clever. Maybe the most famous one-person show to come out of the Edinburgh Fringe Festival, can you name it? Fleabag by Phoebe Waller-Bridge, which there has been just so much discourse about on social media this year because one of the reviews that Fleabag had in its original run at the Edinburgh Fringe was only a three-star review, and so people have kind of used its success to represent the idea that a three-star review is not bad, and if that happens to you, it is not the end of your career. However, we should also at some point have a conversation about the access that Phoebe Waller-Bridge had to the people who helped catapult her to TV stardom because of her family family connections and inherent privilege. But that's a different conversation. Today I'm going to be talking about the one-person shows that I saw this year at the Fringe. I saw 12 of them. Some of them were musicals, some of them were non-musicals, some of them were autobiographical, some of them were fictional. So a whole different range of stuff that we are going to be talking about today. Also, one other little stipulation I want to make before we get into these reviews. I call them all one-person shows because structurally, that's what ties them all together. They are all written to deliver storytelling from one personality or to be about one character. A couple of them technically contain a second or third person, but only in a very minor capacity and in a way that doesn't necessarily take away from it being a one person show. I will defend those examples when I get to them. You have my permission to at me in the comments about my inability to count. I am a maths teacher, lest we forget I can, I can count to one and I'm aware that it is not in fact two. And we're going to start at number 12 with my least favourite one-person show of the Edinburgh Fringe. So first up, we have a solo performance of a play called This Is Paradise. This was at the Traverse Theatre. This was not autobiographical. This was actually a theatre piece. This was a play performed by a solo actor. Where this fell down for me was the direction was very static. The little set piece that it was on was quite impressive. It was a little sort of a raised plinth situation that had a lot of depth but not a lot of width and it was made to look like a miniature cliff but with sort of red arteries going through it kind of like how a cliff face is is cut and it had like little rivers of blood which represented different things. I think it was meant to represent a piece of the Irish coastline. I think it was meant to represent the idea of being on a precipice and being on a cliff edge and everything that that can represent sort of emotionally about someone one's mental state and there was a connection to child loss in it as well so I think that's what sort of the ravines of red were possibly meant to represent and were utilized for at a later point in the play. The problem with this little set 
is that it didn't allow the performer much space to move around or much space to be directed in a particularly versatile way. So the whole thing, the staging was very static and I don't think that helped it be particularly engaging. I will say the writing as well was sort of tonally very consistent the entire time. We were always in this sort of dry, slightly sardonic sense of humor that always had a layer of concern and woe behind it. The whole thing was quite consistently heavy. It didn't really ebb and flow in and out of its darkness. It just kind of drudged through a layer of mild anguish. Not to compare everything to Fleabag, but the success of something like that is the way it balances its comedy with its darkness, with its tragedy. That was a big feature of this year's Edinburgh Fringe, where you injected a certain amount of each in turn. It's the entire nature and setup of how humour works. When you are making a joke, when you're telling an audience a joke, you are creating a level of tension and suspense, and it's the breaking of that tension, the relief and the release from that, that is what prompts the laugh response. I will talk about that with another show later. But this was just tense consistently. There was no humour, there was no relief, there was no letting up, but it also wasn't especially dramatic. It was kind of this one character revisiting her past, steadily making more and more questionable decisions, admittedly with various justifications and reasons for doing this. You couldn't be mad at her because she had a lot of stuff going on but it was also very hard to follow the way that it would be when someone is just telling you a story for 80 straight minutes. It's like having a conversation with someone where they don't stop talking for 80 minutes. You're not going to retain everything that they say. You're eventually going to start counting the ceiling tiles of whatever room you are in. None of this is to say that the performer in question was not very accomplished or that the writing was not of decent quality or that the story is not worth telling. I just think the way that it was told structurally in terms of the direction was not particularly engaging. I wasn't told that story in an effective way, so it made it very difficult for me to enjoy it because I wasn't engaged with it in the first place. It kind of fell at that first hurdle. So that is why I gave this a two star rating. It was not bad theatre, it was not poor quality writing or acting, it just wasn't captivating whatsoever. I described this in my written review as fatally dull, which perhaps is very harsh, but its dullness is what killed it for me. Next was a solo show called Are You Being Murdered? Now, before I tell you about this show, I want to tell you about some of the personalities involved. So it was performed by Arthur Bostrom. He is an actor perhaps best known for Allo Allo. He played the policeman who couldn't speak French, so he would say good morning, which is quoted in my house by my mother and I very often. And this piece was written by David Semple, who is a BBC writer for the programme Father Brown. So everyone involved in this understood the tone of what they were going for, because what this was is this was a sort of a love letter to this golden age of the British BBC sitcom. This is about a particular extra or background artist named Jamie who was working on the programme Are You Being Served? A real programme that was very beloved in Britain in the 70s, if you did not know this. And while he is working on this, somebody else is murdered on the set during a filming. And so it becomes about not only his life as a background artist, but him trying to solve this murder as well. It's not like high stakes murder mystery. It's like polite Sunday afternoon television murder mystery. It's very like Rosemary and Time, Miss Marple kind of vibes, but not even that intense. The whole thing is very polite, very charming, very sedate, but it's clever that it combines this sort of homage and these references to Are You Being Served with a murder mystery element. It's two things that go together quite nicely. This is a really perfect show for anyone specifically of that generation, but it does feel like its concept and many of the references it uses specifically may be too niche to play to a wider audience. Now, I went to go and see this because I'm actually a big fan of Allo Allo. I am a little bit of an old soul. And I've seen Are You Being Served as well, but even many of the references went over my baseball cap clad head simply because I was not alive in the 70s. I was born in the mid 90s and for that I can only apologize. It does feel like if you took your grandparents to go and see this show that they would probably have a lot to enjoy about it. My grandmother would probably really enjoy this, but even so it is not the most thrilling piece in the world 
And the way that Arthur multi-roles as all of these different characters, because he has different zany personalities, the way that you do in a murder mystery, all of these different people who will end up being culprits or suspects or victims. His performance as each of them when he turns into them in dialogue is not completely transformative. They are not distinct enough that it's particularly fun. He is not costumed any different way. He just kind of moves around his one sort of a lounge dressing room type set. It would be nice if there was more variety. Again, tonally, it doesn't really change much. There are moments where they try and add a little bit of suspense and they give us a blackout and then he is revealed again, but it's not remarkably suspenseful. The whole thing is like the kind of thing you would watch of an afternoon on a Sunday when there is very little else on television. But again, in terms of the quality of the performance, I cannot fault the writing particularly. His performance was very good. Like I said, it was endearing. He did stumble quite frequently just over the starts of words, but he picked himself back up. He had a great rapport with the audience. I liked his demeanor. I liked the vibe of the entire thing. I gave this a three star rating. Next, I went to see Linus Karp's How to Live a Jellical Life. If you do not know what this show is, let me just tell you about this. So, Linus is giving kind of like this PowerPoint presentation style solo piece that is somewhere between a TED talk and performance art, basically, where dressed like one of the cats from the motion picture Cats, it is a explanation of the 2019 hit movie musical Cats and how we can learn lessons from it to improve our own jellical lives. It is bonkers, it is off the wall, ridiculous, it is everything you would expect from that description. I, as you may know from previous videos on my channel, am a secret fan of the musical Cats. I grew up with Cats. I know an awful lot about Cats. I used to read Cats fan fiction. I don't think I wrote any, but I, I, I can't promise that. So I feel like I'm probably a rarer audience member than most where I am going into this already knowing the crazy details about these cats, where I think just explaining the plot of cats normally gives Lena so much mileage to get laughs just by introducing their ridiculous names and their concepts and saying, yes, this is the railway cat. He's in charge of the trains, obviously. That would get a laugh from anyone else. And I'm sat there like, yes. I know that already, that's Skimbleshanks. This is not news to me. So I am a challenging audience member for this particular Jellicle show and I appreciate that. But I did feel like I wanted more. I felt like structurally it was just often standing on one side of the stage and talking through bullet points that were happening behind. There was a lot of reliance on gay Twitter memes. That's, I'm, I'm calling them that because that's exactly what they are. Which I laughed, it was funny, but it felt like a comedic crutch. The moments I enjoyed are where the show transformed into something else and we had little game show quizzes with the audience and we had little performance numbers and we had Linus dancing to little bits and pieces and lip syncing and just more variety than standing there kind of dryly and in this low energy way that is funny for 10 minutes but not necessarily for the entire duration talking through the cats of cats. I really want this show to succeed. I do have a lot of fondness for Linus and I enjoyed myself. I can't say I didn't enjoy myself. It was really fun and it was ridiculous. I just think it has such potential to be this even crazier, more ridiculous thing. Linus is starting on a new show later this year in which Linus is going to be playing Princess Diana. So I am hoping for utter madness from that, which, you know, is what you would expect given the description. Next up, we are still in three-star territory, FYI, and the next one is The Mind Mangler, member of the Tragic Circle. This may be controversial that I've put this so far down my list. Do not abandon me, I can explain. I can justify my reasons. So I had already seen Henry Lewis playing The Mind Mangler in Magic Goes Wrong twice. I saw Magic Goes Wrong just before lockdown in March 2020, and I saw it uh, after it had reopened at the Apollo Theatre in the West End. I really enjoyed Henry's character in the show. I was really excited to hear that that character was getting a spin-off solo show at the Edinburgh Fringe. I figured we would learn more about his backstory and we would see another variety of the act and it would be something tailored for the Fringe. Like it would be that character goes to the Fringe rather than that character performs at the charity benefit, which is what Magic Goes Wrong was. 
And it is that, kind of, but the material and the jokes and the lines and the tricks are the same ones as From Magic Goes Wrong. It's basically the same script with some changes. There are a couple of new magic tricks. There is a new thing at the beginning that gets referenced at the end. Jonathan Sayer is still present. That is not a spoiler alert. He is on the posters where it says he is performing as the Stooge, which is hilarious. They've amped his role up the tiniest bit where he appears a couple more times and tries to play different people, but he's still his same Stooge character playing each of those people unconvincingly. What kind of sucks is that not only is it the same material from Magic Goes Wrong, so I know where all these tricks are going and where all the jokes are going and it doesn't have that level of suspense and uncertainty and the ability to suspend disbelief, it turns out there are other things you can work out that I'm not going to spoil for you if you've seen it multiple times and it becomes obvious based on some of the things that are said that some of the things you thought were amazing and awe-inspiring are very obvious tricks and you can work out that they're being done in a way that's almost cheap. That might all sound very ambiguous. Potentially, if you're someone who has seen the show in London and then also in Edinburgh or just seen it enough times, you will have also cottoned on to the things you can realize upon multiple return visits. I just think this whole thing was a missed opportunity. I think if they were going to take this show to Edinburgh and have it be seen by so many people and have it be the big hit that it is, I wish they had done a newer script. Or if they are going to just do He Does Magic Tricks on stage again, that they could have done at least fresher magic tricks and not recycled exactly the same jokes, exactly the same lines. Once again, he has this same emotional arc with Jonathan Sayer. There are different things that prompt the end of it, but we end up in the same place as we ended up in Magic Goes Wrong. It is an exact parallel with what happens to those two characters in the show that we've already seen. And yet, if you haven't seen Magic Goes Wrong, which I'm sure many of the people in that audience hadn't, Aaron hadn't when I took him to this show, there is lots to enjoy about this. It is objectively really fun. He's a great character. They have this brilliant dynamic on stage because they're so close in real life. Of course they do. The whole thing works very well. My only disappointment with this is that it is recycled material. Next was another three-star show, Bloody Mary Live. This described itself as a stand-up piece, and in truth it was somewhere between stand-up comedy and performance art, but it was this kind of theatricalized version of a stand-up routine, where it was a stand-up routine as a character, and the character was Bloody Mary. Mary Tudor, the first daughter of Henry VIII. If you are Six fans and you're trying to work out how she is involved with Six, she is the daughter of Catherine of Aragon, the first of Henry VIII's wives. No, 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 no way. That one. The yellow one. Mary was a Tudor princess whose life of luxury and privilege was upturned when her father divorced and ostracized her mother and pivoted the entire country around his change in religious beliefs so that he could remarry to Anne Boleyn. Mary is now a Catholic in a Protestant country who is not allowed to speak to her mother and has massive royal daddy issues, which she plays on very much in this stand-up routine. The performer is called Olivia Miller. She's fantastic. She has this Californian vocal dry that works very well as this kind of teen, grungy, angry, goth girl, emo chick, resentful daughter. And she's also really funny. She does a great job of delivering this stand-up and delivering it in a way that feels tailored to the exact audience she has there. Whether she does the same sort of ad-libs and follow-ups after her jokes every night, because a lot of it is very dark humor. Sometimes she gets a big laugh. Sometimes she gets more of a groan. And then she has, you know, follow-up things that she can say after that. She's a very established and practiced comic in that sense. She doesn't just leave it to hang. She knows when she needs to add a little something in to get the laugh that she is determined to get. What makes this even more interesting is she involves the audience so much. Oh, so much. This particular venue was an interesting one. It was at the Edinburgh International Conference Centre and it kind of felt like this big conference room that you would get in a hotel with cabaret tables. It was all sort of oddly lit. I did see a relaxed performance, so I'm not convinced that the lighting as it was at this performance was as it would normally be. I think it was probably a reduced version of their usual lighting. And you know, shout out to shows at the Edinburgh Fringe for giving relaxed performances. That's really beneficial to a lot of people there. But she would get people to put their hands up after asking certain questions and then go around table to table and talk to you. And these were not like easy questions. These were not like, what's your favorite type of food? What best show have you seen at the Fringe? This was like, what is your relationship with your parents? Have you ever told your mother you hated her? Like intense 
stuff. We did like first kiss, we did like worst kiss. I got involved, I was asked questions, I divulged things to the audience at the Edinburgh International Conference Centre. But she builds up this great rapport with her audience. She'd make a fantastic teacher because she remembers names from having been told once for the rest of the show. And a lot of people do that in their solo shows, but she had like seven or eight on the go. I was very impressed as a teacher who tries to do the same thing with remembering students' names. And then we went to this even bolder place where we had these kind of performance art sections where it became much more theatricalized. She got to show off some acting. There was depth, there was intensity. It was fascinating to see her steadily go from this one place to this different place. And then the whole thing built up and up and up. And she'd been slowly changing her accessories and her outfit throughout the course of the show. And that built to a nice visual at the end. And then after that, there was another little subsequent piece. And it wasn't that I disliked that piece. I liked the material there. I just feel like it was weird to have it after what felt like a false ending. The only other criticism I have for this show is that it felt like it was in the wrong venue. It was a very sort of sleek and modern venue. And if this had been in somewhere gothic and grungy with exposed brick and, and damp and dripping like Underbelly Cowgate, it would have been fantastic. I think this would kill at Vault Festival in London because it would be that much more atmospheric. Because when she's trying to do something really real and gritty and dark and she's running around fancy tables in a purple mood lit conference room, it's not really working for her. She has a lot that she is up against. But like I said, I loved her performance. I enjoyed the vibe of the show. I think this material could be further honed and workshopped and become this really polished product. I think it's a really great show for now because it interrogates this historical character and this nickname that she was given and it questions why she is titled that way when history has a whole host of other bloodthirsty rulers who are not given any kind of a similar title, any kind of a similar nickname. It's this double standard in the treatment of her that she is questioning in this show. And I feel like there's a big movement at the moment, especially on social media, especially among young people, to interrogate historical events with reference to today's modern standards and today's modern moral perspective. In short, I think the TikTokers and Gen Z would really like this show. Next up was one of my most anticipated shows of The Fringe. This was Colin Holt's The Death of Anna Mann. Now, Anna Mann is a comedy character that has been created by Colin Holt that I first became aware of, this is a very random backstory, on a Southwestern Railway service. A few years ago, they did away with the Wi-Fi on their trains, which was very upsetting to me at the time, but instead they added this media player function where you could stream various different things. And they had like Love Island on there and cartoons. And they had this one stand-up special from a character called Anna Man. So I watched it. I worked out quite quickly. It had been filmed at a fringe venue somewhere and I really enjoyed it. And I ended up watching it every time I got a Southwestern Railway service. I cannot tell you how many times I have watched this special. I then searched on YouTube everything I could find from Colin Holt and Anna Mann, his character, but I never had the chance to see a live performance. And I was so excited that Anna Mann was making her return to this year's Edinburgh Fringe. And this show bears a lot of similarities to some of the previous ones. The first few minutes of the show, the introductory section, is just so well honed, so well crafted. The way that she engages with different audience members and just sort of chucks out things that seem like random phrases and laughs and aren't going to mean anything, but it's an Edinburgh Fringe show and it's a solo show, so of course they are going to come back to mean something incredibly meaningful later. The way she will say something and make it sound as if it's been a random ad lib, but she is building layers of comedy so that just the laughs keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger because she keeps calling back to other things. She keeps building and building on references and establishing this connection with people in the room, most of whom may not have any idea what this character is that they are meeting. But you do quite quickly get a sense of her. Now, I would describe her as this kind of historically unsuccessful actress filled with unearned confidence, which is just hilarious in and of itself. She's definitely this theatrical diva who has had something of a tortured past, but puts on a very brave face. Now, this show is slightly more serious 
than some of the others. It is still laughs, 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 but it's definitely accessing a harder hitting message and you can feel it building towards something valuable at the end. I think the ending, though I did very much enjoy it and it was very clever, I think there is room to put in an even cleverer, even more hard hitting twist at the end. It's sort of unexpectedly soft when we get this reveal of what the whole show has been about and the layer of meaning behind it. I want it to be this wow moment like I have seen in some of her previous shows. Some of the callbacks that she has done before to earlier lines and the sudden change in meaning have been so impactful and so memorable, I would like for that to be a feature of this one. One of the big differences for this show, I guess, is that she has previously had other performers on stage as kind of like pseudo ensemble members, and this one is just her, but then there's something very valuable about that as well because of the nature of the story being told here. I really don't want to spoil this. It is going to London later this year, so if you want to go and see it for yourselves, you can. She's very funny. She's very theatrical. I would describe this as drag light and a sort of a fun stand-up-esque performance art high concept character. The humour style is very if Saturday Night Live was a thing in the UK. And this is just a big personal recommendation from me. This is my sense of humour and I really enjoyed it. This was a four star show from me. Next up was another drag show, but this was drag with a capital D. This was Myra Dubois' A Problem Shared. Now, I have met Myra Dubois before in the past. I went to a Halloween night at a club in Manchester. I can't even remember which one. It was on Canal Street. I had a genius Halloween outfit where I was dressed like uh, Rebecca Vardy as the devil. Don't at me. It was very big news at the time. She did not understand my costume. There was a whole banter back and forth from on the stage. I did not win the costume competition. I was furious. I was robbed. But I have been an enormous fan of Myra Dubois ever since. You may know her from her role as one of the drag queens in the Everybody's Talking About Jamie motion picture. She has also, I believe, appeared on Britain's Got Talent and is very much a rising star in the drag world. I would describe her as the UK's answer to Bianca Del Rio because I've seen so many drag performers have brilliant banter with the audience. I think that's quite a common thing in UK drag queens. You see it in this kind of pantomime tradition, especially when they're hosting at drag nights. It's very common for them to brutally rip into audience members. And that is very much a fixture of this show. I have seen no one do this better or faster or more cuttingly than Myra Dubois, but always in good fun. It is always good natured, and just enjoyable. She gets away with it in the same way Bianca Del Rio gets away with it because she involves herself in the joke. Now the conceit of this particular show is that she is solving the problems of audience members. You write your problem on a piece of paper before the show, you hand them in and she reads through a handful of them. Obviously she does not get through everyone in the audience. The show actually feels way shorter than it could be. I would happily have watched it for at least another half an hour, maybe 45 minutes, if only just to listen to her do that, to read out audience problems and respond to them, because it's not even the solving of the problem. Sometimes her answers are genuinely very helpful and she dispenses some legitimately good sounding advice, but mostly it's just an excuse for her to have that opportunity to chat and banter with an audience. Before they can even get out a sentence, she is talking to them, sees them, says something, makes a joke, she makes them laugh, she keeps going, it comes back, she sees them again later, she makes the same joke. It's masterfully done insult comedy. The speed of it is awe-inspiring and the hilarity, these are not cheap, easy, low-hanging fruit, it's just genius what she does. You have to imagine she has some of these stock insults prepared because I cannot imagine that she could be coming up with all of these on the fly. And yet some of them are so specific that she must be. I'm impressed. There are other parts of the show as well. She has a sister character who is played by another performer who also had a show at the Fringe. And she kind of facilitates this as an assistant where she gives out the forms at the beginning. She reads out the problems while she is on stage. And there was also a special guest appearance. Now this was a rotating person for each night that Myra was at the Fringe. One night it was Bianca Del Rio herself. How I wish I could have been at that performance because that exchange would have been hilarious. I was there the night before when it was a slightly half-hearted female comedian. Bless her, I'm not entirely sure that she realized what she had signed up for because she just really wanted to talk about her sexual sense of humor that was slightly at odds with 
I'm going to say everyone else in the room and what they had expected from the evening. But Myra salvaged it in such a way that you came to realize it really doesn't matter who the celebrity guest is, she is always going to be able to make it work. To the point that I really questioned if she needed that part of the show at all, especially when everything seemed to come to a close quite quickly subsequently, I would rather she had just spent more time talking to the audience. It's not much of a structured show, it doesn't involve much writing beforehand, but it was my favorite part of the entire thing. After a slight pause to let the camera cool down, I am back because it got so warm because the camera is in disbelief that I'm reviewing this many shows in one video, but we are powering through together. And we've reached the top five. It is getting serious. So in fifth place is another mischief comedy Edinburgh Fringe show, Charlie Russell Aims to Please. Now while the Mind Mangler seemed like a much more commercial, much more obvious Edinburgh Fringe show for mischief to be doing, it's a spin-off from one of their existing shows, people can get a sense before they buy tickets what it might be like. Henry is definitely one of the mischief breakout stars, even though the entire ensemble of them also talented, and everyone they've ever taken on in their shows, I have always been thrilled with all of the performers I have seen in mischief comedy shows. Charlie Russell Aims to Please is a very different show, and I remember when this was announced, I was a lot less certain about what this was going to be. It is playing a smaller venue at the Fringe, however, it is, and I'm going to say it, my favourite of the three shows they're doing in Edinburgh this year. Between this, Mind Mangler and Mischief Movie Night, Charlie Russell's far and away my favourite, and I'm going to tell you why that is. I'm going to attempt to do it without spoilers, but I feel like I might articulate a little bit of the reasoning behind this show, and that might be a little bit of a spoiler. So if you really don't want to know anything about it, I, at this point, I don't know if the show is going to be staged again, but I wouldn't be surprised if we did see it return. You may want to skip ahead to the next review. So the conceit of this is that Charlie Russell is a serial people pleaser. She greets every single member of the audience as they are coming in. She gives us all stickers in a bucket, the significance of which I will tell you about in a minute. And the idea is that she is going to entertain and please every single member of her audience. She is in defiance of the idea that you can't please everybody. And at the beginning, this is just her getting the chance to do a variety show and show off her skill set. She sings musical theatre, she dances, she does comedy, she does serious acting, which is of course played for laughs because she's reading this partner scene with a member of the audience that's written to be deliberately funny, and she does it with a random accent, she lets somebody choose. She will just go off of audience suggestions. Again, another performer that talks a lot to her audience, learns the names, and is very much, seems at least to be tethered to what they ask her to do. I mean, you can imagine people will ask for the same kinds of things generally. But she does have an incredibly impressive skill set, and to be able to adapt to the conversations she's having and <laughs> go with that level of specificity, I mean, letting people choose an accent entirely bold move. Where I think these sections of the show could have gone a little bit further is sometimes I just needed another joke. She did I Can't Say No from Oklahoma, or should I say I Can't Say No. See, I'm not great at accents, that's the difference between us. But she did it in kind of a slapstick way with a broom, and that was funny, but it was the same joke for the duration of the song. I was surprised that she did that for the song. She did another number where she was dancing to a track that had various different dance routines in different styles. And I was expecting something where halfway through, as it keeps flicking back through the same ones, that maybe there would be this gag where the track gets stuck and she ends up doing the wrong dance to each song or it gets like impossibly fast, but it, it didn't. We didn't get another layer of joke. It just became this sincere dance moment, which was kind of a surprise. There was another section where she had prepared a short film and it was her playing both sides of a love scene in a Bridgerton-esque film. And again, about halfway through that, I started to want for another joke, whether it was like a random dog walker to appear in the background and then awkwardly have to leave, or whether it was for like the body double who was clearly playing the other person in each version before the camera flips to try and turn their head and she turns it back. Something like that, where we just needed another laugh to keep it buoyant because it just lasted too long on the same one gag. However, what I did love about this show was the end sequence. Now I said I would explain the stickers. The idea was, after each person decides they have been pleased and thoroughly pleased, not a pity please, they hold up the sticker in the air and then they put it on. And she is going around all the members of the audience and trying to speak to you and work out what she has to do to please you. And as time is progressing, it is starting to feel more and more frenzied. It starts to turn a little bit and seem a little bit desperate and there's a sort of an insidiousness creeping in beneath. Sure enough, it becomes this very vulnerable and very honest 
piece where she starts talking about her own experiences of mental health and family background and circumstances and what has readied her for this mindset where she feels the need to please everyone, where she feels that she has to define her own worth by her ability to make other people laugh and to entertain other people. And it's fascinating and it's heartbreaking and it's very real and and very intense and possibly makes people a little bit uncomfortable. It is certainly not what a lot of mischief comedy fans will have been expecting from this show. Whether there is scope for it to be written in such a way that the audience don't feel quite as anxious about her during this section, I don't know. But if that's what she's going for, then it is achieved very, very well. I think the idea behind the material is very strong and there are ways that each little section can be heightened and can be honed and it would make this a really incredible show. And yes, I did put my sticker on. Charlie Russell did please me. Next was a play called Feeling Afraid As If Something Terrible Is Going To Happen. Now, we talked about Fleabag earlier, and before I'd even arrived at the Fringe, this was being heralded as the new Fleabag, but the gay male Fleabag, because Fleabag previously was famously inaccessible to the gays. Sarcasm. This is a play rather than an autobiographical piece. It has been written by Marcelo Dos Santos. It stars Samuel Barnett of The History Boys and of countless things since The History Boys. It is directed by Matthew Zia, who directed The Wiz recently at The Hope Mill and a bunch of other fantastic stuff before that. And it is being produced, interestingly, by Francesca Moody, who was also the producer behind Fleabag and behind another Edinburgh Fringe hit, Baby Reindeer, at the same venue. The format of this show is that Samuel Barnett plays a stand-up comedian and he's telling us about his sort of recent romantic and sexual escapades. He gets into a very interesting and specific romantic situation that presents him with a particular problem to do with his line of work. It's very interesting. It's very funny throughout. It does the thing that Fleabag does very well, where we're balancing comedy and darkness. And it actually talks quite openly about the anatomy of a joke and the kind of transactional relationship between the comedian and the audience and how a laugh comes about. And it's interesting that it explores that, but it can still exploit it simultaneously. It tells you this is exactly why you're being deceived into laughter. I'ma keep doing it. It's interesting that there is no particular interesting staging. This was in the round in a very small tent of a venue and Samuel Barnett has a stool and a microphone. He moves around to various different points, if only to vary the eye lines and the visibility of him because he's got audiences on all sides. But it's interesting that it doesn't get stale, that it doesn't get stagnant. I think that's him as a performer being very engaging. I think that's elements of the script as well, being interesting, varying the tone enough, different to what I said in the very first show where the whole thing was just kind of on one tonal level. Also the work of Matthew Zia being a very clever director. And this has had a lot of praise from a lot of different people. And it's really great. And it's very interesting to me that it's a theater show based around the idea of stand up. I think this is in prime position to convert a lot of the people who would go to the fringe for stand up comedy into being theater fans. I have only a couple little issues with it personally. One of them is that it does rely fairly heavily on the shock value of gay sexual humor. And if you've seen much or even a handful of gay theater or gay comedians before you've heard all of these jokes, it gets a laugh simply out of alluding to the existence of Grinder. Only a couple of the references are so specifically filthy that they get a laugh simply because I haven't heard them before. But for the most part, it's the same kind of gay jokes that you have heard on a regular basis. My other issue is with the ending. There's a lot of payoff to the very interesting ending to this show. I just feel like it renders the whole thing a little bit pointless. There's a lot of room and a lot of mileage to discuss the ending of this show. I'm not going to spoil it here for you because this is definitely going to get another run somewhere and will probably come to London before too long. But the way that it ends, I feel like it does undercut the few moments of seriousness that it finds along the way. And that's my other issue with it, is it talks momentarily and intermittently about existential dread and this thing from the title, feeling afraid as if something terrible is going to happen. Now that has a double meaning that refers to something very specific in the context of the play, but it does also talk about the level of just sort of background underlying anxiety that the character experiences and discusses in a very self-deprecating way. 
I would like more of an exploration of that because I think that's a lot more interesting and a lot more modern and a lot more relevant and something people experience a lot these days in a post-pandemic world that people don't really talk about. I haven't seen that explored as much on stage, but the gay sex stuff that I have. In third place, my bronze medalist solo show was Manic Street Creature by Maimuna Menon and starring Maimuna Menon with two other musicians sharing the stage with her, helping her to create the show that she does very beautifully. I was a big fan of Maimuna Menon before I even came to this year's Edinburgh Fringe. I enjoyed her in Electrolyte, a previous Fringe hit that she appeared in, that she provided the music for. She's been in Jesus Christ Superstar. I've enjoyed her in The Assassination of Katie Hopkins and Ghost Quartet. She's a fantastic, incredibly distinctive, incredibly unique, fascinating, creative performer. Her show, Manic Street Creature, which is at the same venue as the last show I talked about, Roundabout in Summerhall, is a fascinating study of mental health through a very particular story. I don't know if it's autobiographical, it didn't seem to be autobiographical, but it may be rooted in some biographical elements because the way she told it seemed to be very personal. Or she's a fantastic actress. I do not know. She's been winning a handful of awards for this performance and for the writing of this show, and rightfully so. What's really special about it, and what's really new about it, because we've seen mental health explored in this way before. We've seen relationships like the kind that documented in this show talked about before. We've seen parental issues explored before. What's new and what's unique to Maimuna is her perspective on musical storytelling. I don't think I've experienced anyone so this style of music so meaningfully and so intricately into the story they are telling. She's a musical theatre performer, so she understands the value of music in storytelling. Rather than it being a play that is punctuated with musical moments, she being the writer and the composer gives with both hands. She knows when to articulate with script and she knows when the emotions have become so heightened that she can articulate them more meaningfully and more fully through song. She plays a host of instruments. She sings incredibly. She has the most unique, incredible voice that I am just always obsessed with. The way she composes melodies is beautiful. Occasionally, I would like for her lyrics to delve slightly deeper into some of the stuff that she is talking about, the same way that she does with her script. I like how she manages to capture the voice of her characters with script, and I would like to see more of that reflected in the lyrics as well. I think a lot of the lyrics seem more like pop song lyrics where they are talking about mental health and they're talking about these issues. And in a way, there's a cleverness to that because you get these songs that seem to be just generic and then you later find out that they have a deeper layer of meaning to them when that song is then reprised in a different context. I like that. I do. It's clever. It's a twist. But I think there are definitely moments of the show that would benefit from some more interesting lyrical investigation. Another thing that's fantastic about Maimuna is she so immediately establishes a warmth and a rapport with the audience. She is so likable. She's this brilliant character on stage. And so it kind of feels like a little bit of a disappointment that the majority of the plot is not necessarily about her. We experience someone else's struggles predominantly through her eyes and through her relationship to them. And that allows her to tell a story about herself and to reveal truths about herself towards the end. But I would definitely love to have more time with her feelings about the situation in the story that she tells. And those are the only reasons that this was a four star rating from me. Next up, now these top two shows were battling it out for first and second place. I loved both of them. We have reached my five star reviews of one person shows. This was Bloody L. I saw this at the Traverse Theatre, which was the same venue, the same auditorium, where I saw that play I talked about right at the beginning. Now that had a very static and very confining set. This one was all layers and different instruments. She ran all around this stage. She had so many options. I'm talking about Lauren Redding. She is the solo performer, writer, composer, singer, accompanist for Bloody L. This was another solo show that is deceptively long that I would happily have sat through more of. This was an incredible piece of theatre. This was a gig musical. So again, it's another one similar to Manic Street Creature, where you have this very articulate script that really captures a character's voice, and then the songs don't necessarily go into the same depth, but it's because they are meant to sound like pop songs to a certain extent. 
They riff around the idea of a topic rather than mining into the heart of it. But beyond that tiny detail, I really have nothing else to criticize about this show. I was initially surprised after leaving that it hadn't been as traumatizing as I was expecting it to be. I think I'm used to one-person shows and especially queer one-person shows, which this is, to go more into those traumatizing events. If it's a queer coming of age story, if it's a queer first love story, if it's a queer coming out story, I am expecting more pain and anguish that will probably be overpowered, but I am expecting those moments. But kudos to this for just wanting to live in the euphoric joy in between those moments. Those moments are definitely alluded to, but they are not exploited for emotional devastation on stage. And on reflection, I'm grateful for that. I appreciate seeing a queer narrative that doesn't have to be about trauma. I think I've been conditioned by so much theater to expect that, but it's not obligatory for queer performers and queer characters to have to put themselves through hell just because that is the expected narrative. This was a beautiful show telling a beautiful story and the character that she presented. Again, another one I don't know to what extent it's autobiographical, whether it's strictly so, whether it's just informed by certain traits, past experiences, whatever. It doesn't matter because the character on stage, whether or not she is a real person or a reflection of Lauren, is a beautiful character. She is so likable. She becomes everyone's best friend instantly. What I want is for this show to be able to move to a venue where more people like that character on stage can see themselves reflected. I'm talking about queer female theatre goers. I'm talking about working class theatre fans because those things were very much not reflected in this particular audience at the Traverse Theatre, which is fine. They came to see some great theatre that had already won an award for Watson Stage for Best Regional Show, which was very well deserved. But I want this to connect with the people that it will mean something powerful to because it has such capacity for connection. I talked earlier about a one-person show where one person played a lot of different characters and there wasn't enough variety. This was established brilliantly here. You could always tell at any given point who Lauren was playing and there was a broad difference in accent, in posture, in, in costuming, though she was wearing the same outfit the entire time. Clever things were done to ensure that at any given moment you understood who we were seeing on that stage. Another thing I will say that I really appreciated about Bloody L. Now, I haven't talked about a lot of the other musicals I saw. That's coming up in the next video roundup. However, not enough shows at the Fringe understand the value of incidental music. I will talk more about that in the next video. But you have these shows that had big teams and big casts and didn't have any incidental music. Bloody L manages to feature incidental music even though she is the only damn person on that stage because she is using loop pedals. So she will play a little riff, loop it, and then that will underscore the rest of the scene. And it is so effective in creating an establishing atmosphere. Because it's hard telling a story when you are one person trying to deliver a conversation between multiple characters with something that lasts a long time. You know, scenes are gonna have different vibes. It's hard to explain all of that to an audience when you are just one person storytelling by yourself without it getting monotonous and an audience becoming disengaged. If you wanna keep them on your side, you need little tools like the underscoring to help keep them engaged and to help them understand what it is that they are watching. So the fact that she was able to do this as the solo person on stage, I thought was incredible. But it was so touching, so affecting. I cried at this one. It's a beautiful story. I would very much like to see it again. Nay, I need to see it again. It is very important to me. I get to see Bloody L again. It was an incredible piece of theater. And my number one solo show from the Edinburgh Fringe. This is one you very well may have heard of. It was one that I was anticipating very much going into it. I had missed it at the Turbine Theatre in London, but I was so happy to be catching Rob Madge's solo show, My Sons Are Queer, But What Can You Do? Now, as I sit here and tell you this, only a few hours ago, it was announced that this show will be transferring to play a limited season at the Garrick Theatre in the West End, which is just huge news. It's this amazing opportunity for Rob to tell this beautiful story and to bring this wonderful, wholesome, heartwarming show to more audiences in London. I'm so thrilled for Rob and their family that this is happening. Let me tell you why this show is so special. So if you're familiar with Rob Madge on social media, you may have seen some of the Twitter videos and TikTok videos and Instagram videos, whichever platform is your preferred, of Rob as a child creating a Disneyland parade in their home and putting on various performances and getting up to various antics with their incredibly patient and incredibly supportive parents. 
and they have always had big theatre kid energy. Rob was also a child actor, perhaps best known for playing Gavroche in the 25th anniversary concert performance of Les Miserables. They also performed in Oliver and Mary Poppins and various other things. More recently seen in the UK tour of Les Miserables and Bedknobs and Broomsticks, Rob has now turned all of those memories and all of those rediscovered home videos into a beautiful solo show that on the face of it is about how to put on a Disney parade in your home, but is really about how to support your queer children. Children who may be coming to terms with their sexuality or their gender identity. This show talks beautifully about both without laboring the point. About halfway through this show, I started to gently cry. I didn't stop crying for the duration of the performance. It's beautiful. I've probably said that a handful of times, but it's the most appropriate adjective. It is so heartwarming. It's so affecting. It's clever to intersperse it with the video footage because that's such an easy way to win over an audience. Everyone is completely captivated by these beautiful, incredible memories. It reminds you of your own childhood in many ways. It makes people think of their parents and their grandparents and just fond memories. There's such a warmth to it. It's incredibly nostalgic. It's incredibly sweet. It also gives Rob a couple of minutes to sit down while everyone is just laughing at their childhood diva antics. But I cannot recommend this show enough if you are a queer adult, if you are a queer youth, if you are a parent of a queer child. This is a really important piece of theatre that is not whatsoever hard hitting. You sob and you sob because it's beautiful and it's tear jerking in its heartwarming joy rather than being intense and traumatizing and difficult. Like I said, we have more than enough LGBT theater and narratives that live in that place of trauma and challenge, and it's great to see something that exists separately to that. I think its success is almost formulaic in three parts. There's such an honesty and an integrity to it, but it combines this reminder of the capacity that families have for love with the love of Disney and this nostalgia and this sort of undefeatable childhood joy and glee that resurfaces while you're watching it. And finally, there's this self-love when you get to live as your authentic self and the relief that this can bring potentially after years of feeling othered and less than and alone in many ways. It makes me feel incredibly grateful to Rob's wonderful parents and so grateful to Rob for sharing their own important story in a way that on the face of it can seem potentially a little self-indulgent. In fact, it's completely the opposite. It's an act of selflessness that reaches out and connects with young queer people in a meaningful and profound way. I could get very emotional just talking about this show, but it was stunning. I cannot fault it whatsoever. I'm so excited for people to get the chance to see it in London. So if you're watching this video now and you haven't already, you can literally buy tickets to go and see Rob Madge's show at the Garrick Theatre in London. And stay tuned to see if any of the other shows I've talked about in this video have any future plans. I would not be surprised to see a few of them possibly coming to London, possibly touring to other areas of the UK, maybe returning at next year's Edinburgh Fringe. Keep your eyes peeled. And thank you very much for listening to all of my thoughts. My voice is starting to go again because I've been talking for multiple hours as I sit here staring at a camera reviewing all of these shows from the Edinburgh Fringe. Thank you for lasting all the way to the end of this video if you have made it here. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed today's video, feel free to give me a super thanks down below. Like I said, I bankrupted myself buying Edinburgh Fringe accommodation and donuts. So if you would like to contribute to the cause, please feel free. If you did enjoy the video, make sure you're subscribed to my Stage YouTube channel for plenty more content coming very soon, including one more Edinburgh Fringe review roundup where I talk all about my favourite and least favourite musicals of the Fringe. I am very excited for that one. You should be as well. Also, feel free to go to patreon.com forward slash Mickey Joe Theatre, where you can support me as a stagey content creator and also gain access to some exclusive photo and video content. I hope that everyone is staying safe and that you have a stagey day. For ten more seconds, I'm Mickey Joe Theatre. Oh my god, hey. Thanks for watching, have a stagey day. Subscribe! <laughs>